The motoring public relies on the flag person immensely on these work crews. Uh, they need to know and they want to know what to do when they come on our work zones. They want direction. They want to know what lane to be in and how to proceed and what to watch out for. Flagger is the controlling factor for safety for everybody on that project and it should be dealt with as such. When flagging, it's very imperative that you never turn your back to the traveling public or vehicles entering your construction zone. It's much like a football game where the offensive line protects its quarterback. You are the eyes and ears of uh, your team that's out there working and it's no different. Your crew is depending on you and it's imperative that your job is done. So I've actually been on a cruise where I've been on a crew where a flag person has been hit by the mirrors of a vehicle and uh, injured seriously. There's been other injuries and fatalities while people have been out there flagging. It's a very dangerous job to do. The flag person must be on their toes at all times, know what they're doing, know to, where to position themselves, and what types of traffic control should be out there and maintained in the proper locations. An effective flagging operation is not something that just happens. It's a result of planning, proper training, and the use of good flagging procedures. This program was developed to help prepare you to be a flagger. As a flagger, you're in contact with the public more than anyone else on the job. Your attitude and appearance directly affect the public's view of operations. A flagger's responsibilities are critical in keeping the work zone safe. Remember, your job as a flagger is the most important one on the work crew. The lives of you, your fellow workers, and motorists will depend on you. Your first responsibility as a flagger is to have the proper clothing and equipment in good condition. Improper equipment reduces the driver's ability to understand your instructions. Neat dress and appearance also help you gain the driver's respect, making your job that much easier. On all MnDOT projects, your clothes shall include a clean vest, pants, and hat that meet the ANSI requirements. This clothing makes you more visible to traffic and makes you stand out from the other workers. A hard hat may also be required on site, if stated by the project's contractor. It is also a good idea to carry an air horn to alert your co-workers if a vehicle appears likely to run into the work area. The main traffic device used by flaggers is the stop slow paddle. This sign is octagon shaped, at least 18 by 18 inches with six inch high letters. The paddle shall be mounted on a handle that measures at least five feet from the ground to the bottom of the sign. A seven-foot mounting height is recommended to make the paddle more visible. Before beginning any flagging operation, advanced warning signs must be in place. For most flagging operations, this will include road work ahead sign, one lane road ahead sign, and a flagger symbol sign. In some cases, other advanced warning signs such as a be prepared to stop sign may be used, but in all cases, the proper signs must be in place before flagging begins. With advanced warning signs in place and with proper equipment, the flaggers may now begin controlling traffic. Drivers are often tired, inattentive, or impaired, thus requiring you to remain alert and on your feet, facing traffic at all times. Never turn your back on oncoming traffic and never stand directly in the path of approaching traffic. Make sure you are visible to oncoming traffic by standing alone, away from other workers and work vehicles. Locate your flagging station in a highly visible area. Avoid standing where the sun is behind you and avoid standing in shadows, obscuring you from the approaching drivers. Allow yourself an emergency escape route away from the path of errant vehicles. Park your own vehicle off the road, away from your flagging station. Generally, flagging operations require three basic skills, stopping, releasing, and slowing traffic. To stop traffic, 
Stand on the shoulder of the roadway with the stop paddle away from your body toward the near edge of the pavement. Raise your free hand with the palm exposed to the approaching driver. Look directly at the approaching traffic and make eye contact with the driver. After you have stopped the first vehicle, remain on the shoulder of the road. This is your normal flagging location. You should never stand in the traffic lane. However, after stopping the first vehicle, and if drivers of approaching vehicles are unaware of your presence, it may be necessary for you to stand in the traffic lane. You may only stand near the center line. Do not cross the center line. When you are satisfied that the drivers of all approaching vehicles are aware of your presence, you should move back to your normal flagging location on the shoulder. Keep your paddle on stop until you are safely on the shoulder of the road. Remember to watch out for traffic that may be coming from behind you by looking over your shoulder. And never turn your back to oncoming traffic or stand in the path of moving traffic. To release traffic from the closed or open lane, turn the slow side of the paddle to face the vehicles. With your free arm, signal the drivers to proceed. Be direct and point in the direction you want traffic to go. Never wave the paddle. After all the vehicles have passed, turn your paddle to display stop and wait for the next vehicle. In some cases, you may not need to stop traffic, but only slow it down. In these cases, always stand on the shoulder of the road. Display the slow paddle to the oncoming traffic. Use your free arm to motion traffic to slow down. And remember, never stand in the path of oncoming traffic. If you learn these three basic skills, stop, release, and slow traffic, you will be well prepared for any flagging operation. Situations will vary, and how you apply these skills will differ from project to project. Remember, never start any flagging operation without the proper equipment, including advanced warning signs. Always stand in a highly visible and safe location and never turn your back on approaching traffic. Now, let's look at some typical situations that a flagger may face. The first situation is single flagger operation. Sometimes only one flagger is needed to control traffic on a low volume, two lane road. Where only one flagger is used, the work area must be short and on a straight section of roadway. The flagger must be visible to approaching traffic from both directions. In this situation, the flagger is positioned in the closed lane at the beginning of the taper. The flagger stops the traffic approaching in the closed lane. When the open lane is clear, the flagger allows traffic to proceed. Remember, a single flagger operation is only acceptable for low volume conditions where there is a good sight distance from both approaches and the work area is short. The second situation involves only one flagger restricting only one direction of traffic. An example of this is an area where trucks are loading or unloading and are blocking the lane. The flagger stops traffic in the usual manner. Once the work has been completed and the way is clear, the flagger releases traffic. When releasing traffic on a two-lane highway where traffic is stopped temporarily in one lane, turn the paddle a quarter turn so that the word stop faces you. In this position, the sign is parallel to the shoulder of the road so that neither stop nor slow can be read by motorists approaching from either direction. The stop message then will not confuse the traffic moving in the opposite direction. The third situation, and probably the most common, is the two flagger operation. When two flaggers are used, they must always be able to communicate with one another. This can be done by keeping visual contact, using radios, or using the flag carrying method. In these cases, one flagger is always in charge of the operation. If visual contact is possible in the work zone, then the operation normally works like this. One flagger displays the stop paddle and stops traffic, while the second flagger displays the slow paddle and releases traffic. The first flagger continues to display the stop paddle and stop all traffic until the second flagger turns his paddle to stop and gives an all clear signal. 
Now this signal tells the first flagger he may release his traffic by displaying the slow paddle. The all clear message can be given visually by using a hand signal, such as lifting one's hand. Be careful, however, not to use hand signals that may confuse the motorist. When visual contact is not possible, such as over hills or around curbs, then radios are the best way to maintain communication between flaggers. If radios are not available, then the flag carrying method is another way to maintain communication between the flaggers. The first flagger hands a flag to the last car allowed to go through. When that car reaches the second flagger, he hands him the flag. Having received the all clear, the second flagger can now allow traffic to flow safely in the opposite direction. Remember, communication between flaggers is vital, and radios are the best way to maintain communication. An advanced flagger may be used where there is limited sight distance to the activity area, or where long lines of traffic form. In a situation such as a limited sight distance, the advanced flagger should stop each vehicle and inform the driver of the situation ahead. Where there are long lines of stopped traffic waiting to proceed, the advanced flagger should move down the line and inform each driver of the reason for the delay and the approximate length of the delay. The fourth situation is the use of a pilot car for traffic control. Now, this method works best when the route is particularly long or dangerous, or where the work area changes so often that proper signing is difficult. The pilot car is used to guide a train of vehicles through a job or detour. This operation uses a flagger at each end of the one-lane section. In this type of operation, the flaggers hold all traffic on each end of the work zone until the pilot car arrives and leads the traffic through the work zone. The fifth situation is a nighttime flagging operation. Now, these procedures are generally the same as daytime except for some equipment changes. A flashlight with a glow cone, a retro reflectorized vest, pants, hat, and a retro reflectorized stop slow paddle are required for all nighttime flagging operations. All flagger stations at night should have auxiliary lighting. To stop an approaching vehicle, stand on the shoulder of the road holding the paddle away from your body. Do not stand in the travel lane. Hold the flashlight with the glow cone in front of your body to attract the driver's attention. To release traffic, turn the paddle to slow and direct traffic to proceed by pointing the flashlight into the open lane. Do not wave the flashlight while releasing traffic. This might confuse the drivers. If possible, the flagging station should be lit by auxiliary lighting. This is the safest way to flag at night. The more visible you are, the easier it is for drivers to see you and to follow your instructions. The sixth and final situation deals with emergencies such as a broken utility line, an accident, or a washout. In these situations, the proper flagging equipment may not always be available. In that case, a 24 by 24 inch red flag may be used for flagging traffic. In emergencies, your first priority is to warn the public of the hazard. To stop traffic, stand on the shoulder of the road and extend the flag into the roadway. Raise your other hand to the stop position. To release traffic, drop the flag to your side and with your free hand, motion traffic to proceed. Do not use the flag to motion traffic through. This confuses the drivers. To alert and slow traffic, the flag should be waved from the ground to shoulder height. As soon as the proper equipment is available, the stop slow paddles should be used. Now, let's summarize the six flagging situations that we just discussed. Single flagger operation. This operation is acceptable for low volume conditions where there is good sight distance and the work area is short. A single flagger also may be used to restrict one direction of traffic. This operation is normally used where one lane of traffic is periodically blocked. Two flagger operation. This is the most common flagging procedure. A flagger works on each end of the work zone to control the movement of traffic through the work area. Good communication between flaggers is critical during this operation. Pilot car operation. This method is used when the work zone is particularly long, dangerous, or complicated. 
nighttime flagging operation. This can be a dangerous operation because of poor visibility at night. In all nighttime flagging operations, all traffic control devices must be retro-reflectorized, and the flagging station should be lit. Emergency flagging. Under emergency situations, 24 by 24 inch red flags may be used to control traffic until stop slow paddles can be obtained. Remember, no matter what flagging procedure is used, always stay alert, always face oncoming traffic, and always stand alone in a good visible location, away from other workers and work vehicles, and never stand in the path of approaching vehicles. Your job as a flagger is one of the most important jobs in the work zone. Everyone, including the motorists, fellow workers, and you, will depend on your ability to properly follow these flagging procedures. If you ever have any questions about flagging operations, don't hesitate to ask your supervisor. You may refer to the Minnesota Flaggers Handbook for additional information. Flagging is one of the most important jobs in any construction, maintenance, or utility operation. It is also one of the most dangerous. However, with proper training, equipment, and procedures, flagging can be safe and effective. The lives of you, your fellow workers, and the driving public will depend on you.